today we've got a Jeep transfer case here. It's an NP247J. Took this out of a 99 Jeep Grand Cherokee Laredo. It was making a pretty bad uh, growling type sound. So I want to get it apart and see what was causing that noise. I've got another video out there where I fairly meticulously went through and tore apart a junkyard transfer case, rebuilt it, and we put that in the other night. That definitely solved all the growling noise, so there's something going on inside of this transfer case, and I'd kind of like to find out what it is. You can kind of see that uh, this one has a lot of fluid leakage around the gaskets, it was blowing out the seals, pretty wet. You could tell the previous owner did not really take care of the Jeep very well. We drained uh, this one when we took the bottom plug out, only about a cup of fluid came out. So we know this one ran dry for quite a while. Was making kind of a popping sound, probably a loose chain. But uh, we'll see. So let's uh, start taking this one apart. I'm not sure why, but on the top, they've got three of these 12-point bolts, and they're really long. Then there's this one standard bolt here in the middle, and then two on my right. When we pulled this one out, we had a couple of the studs came out. The nuts didn't come loose on the stud. The whole stud came out. I've got those. We'll put those in later. I'm not an expert at diagnosing problems, but right off the bat when I turn this, it seems a bit noisy, but that may be normal. Not sure. Or it could be that uh, front output shaft bearing has gone bad. The first step is to remove these four tail cone bolts. Remembering where that bracket is at. Once that's busted loose, you're going to remove this hard to see rubber plug here, which will expose a snap ring down inside that you'll have to spread before you can pull this entire tail cone section off. I've already taken this plug out when it was still on the vehicle, drained all the fluid out of it. But if you don't have that done already, you want to do that. Otherwise, when you tip this thing, it'll spill out on you. I'm going to take these four 13 millimeter bolts out here on the rear tail cone housing. Now you want to get some kind of a dead blow hammer. Pound on this a little bit. Most likely it was put back together with a silicone gasket seal, so you need to just kind of break that loose. Okay, that's loose now. So now you pry out this little plastic plug and down inside there is a snap ring that you'll have to spread apart it would be really great to have the right exact tools but these will eventually work. Okay, it's out of the groove. So there's your rear tail section. Inside of here you can see that 
snap ring up there that you had to spread apart. That snap ring goes over a groove in this bearing. Now you've got this rear tail housing bearing on here held on by a snap ring. The groove is to the back side. That's the only way it's going to line up with that slot in the tail housing. Get that snap ring off there. That bearing just slides right off. This is your oil pump. It's held in place by a, a cog here that fits in like a puzzle piece in the tail housing so this won't spin. This is your oil pump tube that goes in here, takes a hard turn, goes down inside this bump and goes to a screen that's tucked right in here beside the drain plug. So this shaft here is what your shift fork is riding on down inside. Why it's so long and sticks out, I haven't figured that out. Inside the tail cone, there's not. There's not a bushing inside of here. It just fits inside of there. But there's nothing going on in there. No bushing, nothing. So we'll see if this uh, oil pump tube We're able to pull that out and get it out of the way. It's connected by a little hose, so it can come apart separately. Get it out of the way. Now there's another snap ring. Snap rings are the same size. Once you've got that snap ring off, you can slide the oil pump off. Just kind of take note of which direction it was on there. It's pretty obvious. The back has all these kind of black torque screw types things. The front looks like that with the part numbers and such. You can set that aside. Now this black thing right here is what they call the viscous coupler and it's held in by a snap ring here not this type of a snap ring but the other kind that just comes together with two sharp edges a little harder to get out of there but if you got the right tool you can make easy work of those snap rings if you don't have the right tool they're a little bit of a booger but at this point what we're going to do is we're going to turn this thing, set it on some blocks so that we can start operating straight up and down on this thing. So we're going to take this shaft, turn it straight up. Now we've got this tipped up on end here. You can put some blocks underneath the bottom, catch those studs, hold that thing pretty nicely in this position. Now this will allow you to take off these cam, or I call them the clamshell bolts that are going around the outside. Note the location of the three 13 millimeter, I believe, uh, 12 point socket ones up on top. And then on each side, there are two longer bolts with washers, and they go into these blocks where you have a pry point. So these are a little bit longer than the other hex bolts here. So keep those two separate, one on each side. Note the location of the three 12 point socket bolts. Get those all out. We'll tap on this. There are some uh, centering pins in here. So when you tap it, you want to try and kind of tap up on it because you're not going to move it side to side because there are a couple of alignment pins in there. So we'll get the dead blow once we get these bolts out. We'll give it a couple wraps. We'll get this gasket to split apart. The 12 point bolts in the back are actually 10 millimeter. They're very long and you may want to kind of clean the threads before you back them out of there. 
The other bolts are all 15 millimeter hex. Keeping in mind there are those two longer ones, one on each side that have a washer on them. Most of these around here came out pretty easy. This one bolt here, the longer one with the washer, it was a little tighter. I had to take my extension off before I could get enough oomph there. Okay, now all the clam bolts are out. You've got your little oil pump tube sticking through here. That won't hurt anything, but you want to get your dead blow hammer and you want to kind of try and hit up on this top piece of the clamshell. There are these pry points, one on each side. You can get a screwdriver in there and get some leverage in here. And yep, I can feel the gasket starting to give way here. You don't want to go in here and try and pry along this heavily machined surface and scuff that out. You got these two nice factory provided pry points, so one on each side. Okay, there she came apart with a little clunk. A little bit more of a pry over here. There we go. Okay. Get up and off of that. Gotta get it off of that pin. There we go. Now the oil pump tube. It'll probably come up with you, okay. Yeah, okay, the uh, shaft. If you want to, you can kind of push on that, keep it in place for now. Otherwise, it'll pull out of the shift fork. But there's what she looks like on the inside. Hopefully, I've got it in the shot here, but you can see the screen on the pickup tube. Pickup tube runs along there, turns the corner goes on up, turns into the oil pump. You've got your little pocket bearing here. Uh, there is a chain guide. Uh, crazy enough on the last one, I knew there was a chain guide. I didn't see one in the old one, so I didn't put one back in, but probably important. Based on the way this sounded when it was in the Jeep, I really thought we were going to see an extremely loose chain here, but actually it looks fairly tight. When you don't have the nose cone and the bearing on here, you're going to get a little bit of slack here, but in general, this chain feels pretty tight. The gears look pretty good. The next thing to take off is this viscous coupler, maybe called a progressive clutch. Inside of here you've got some clutch plates. And the idea with this thing is that in most cases it will not transfer power to the front wheels unless it's absolutely needed. If it detects slip between the front wheels and the back wheels, it builds up some pressure in here, pushes those clutch plates together, and then you're going to turn those front wheels. If I put a screwdriver in here and hold this front wheel steady, you can see that I can turn the shaft. It's taken a fair amount of friction for me to do this, but right now, this viscous coupler is allowing it to slip. So you would be providing power to the rear wheels, but the front wheels would not be getting very much power at this point helps to save gas mileage, makes them act a little bit better as far as drivability. The next step is to get this viscous coupler off of there. On here there's a snap ring and underneath that there's a little washer. There are better pliers for doing this but if you stay at it you can eventually get this snap ring up and off. Got one corner out. 
working my way around. Keep this one corner out. Got that snap ring loose. Underneath that, there is a washer. At this point, this viscous coupler can come up and off of here. It's fairly heavy, weighs about five pounds. Uh, could be full of uh, some fluid, so it may drip a little bit on you. When you go try to put this thing back on, sometimes it doesn't just exactly fall into place. There's a bottom gear and a top gear, and you kind of got to get those lined up, and you got to do a lot of wiggling, and then eventually it'll seem to plop into place. But for now, it just comes up and off. Sometimes the washer will stick on the inside of here. In this case, it stayed down there on top of the needle pins. So this is all one piece, and it can now be set off to the side. You've got this washer on top of these 47 little needle pins in there. So you can get that up out of the way. Keep track of where all these things came from. Now down inside here, you've got 47 little needle pins going around that shaft. And if you lift this gear up off there, they'll fall off, they'll go down into the planetary. Bad news, so before you lift this gear up and off of there, you want to put a towel down in there to make sure you don't drop any of them down in there where they're hard to get. First though, you need to take off the snap rings that are holding these big gears on. Again, there's a better kind of a snap ring pliers to get these. These are kind of a booger. If you stay at it one way or the other, it seems like you can finally get them. But having the right tools would sure be nice. I had it up. And get underneath it with a screwdriver. Okay, there we go. Work my way around. I'm underneath it with a screwdriver. I'm going to keep working my way around, get that snap ring off. Then we'll do the same thing to the gear on the back. These snap rings are real fighters unless you have the right uh, pliers for doing that job. But basically I was able to get one side up, get a screwdriver underneath it, the other side up, get a screwdriver underneath it, leave the two screwdrivers in there, get my snap ring pliers, get it stretched, was able to pull it up a little bit. Once you get it up quite a ways, then eventually you can get it to come off of there. Do the same thing with the snap ring on the back. It got a little bit better I guess from, from main shaft to front wheel shaft. Got this one up. Got it to the point where the snap ring came up and off of the top of the gear and now it's pretty easy to make sure it doesn't come back on but just work your way around. And just this very last little piece here. Pry that out in the way I guess. Yeah there we go. Okay, that one's off. These snap rings are the same size, front and back. The gears appear to be the same size gears, but you want to just note which is the rear gear, which is the front gear, if you're going to put them back on. So you might you know, make some kind of a mark on those gears, something to distinguish them. I'm just going to take a center punch and make one very tiny little dot on the front wheel gear. Barely enough that you can see it there, but that's my visual clue. 
at this point if you're careful you can take the chain and the two gears off if you notice this gear on the main shaft it slides up and down over the top of this collar and inside this collar is those 47 needle pins so if you're careful lift this up at the same time you're getting this back one get that main shaft gear off got that rear one off I'm just going to keep everything together lift both gears off, keep this entire assembly just like this, put it off to the side. Now at this point we've got the two gears and the chain off of there. The needle pins are still in there. They're inside of this hub. This hub would pull up if I slipped and pulled it up all those little needle pins would fall down into the planetaries not a big deal we're planning on taking this all the way apart so eventually you can get them out of there but far better to pack a towel in there rag something so that when you lift this piece up and off those little pins if they fall off don't go anywhere in here now you can see here's the rod that's got the shift fork on it uh, there's the shifting cam over there there's a pin on the back of that shift fork that goes into the cam. There's a little spring and a button that pushes out on some notches in that cam. Those are your detents for your neutral, four low, four high. And that can be taken apart here if you want to. Unscrew that, the spring and everything will come out that hole. Down inside here you've got the planetary gears. As of right now I don't see anything that would have been causing the really bad growl that we were hearing. Again possibly it could be this bearing on the front output. We'll eventually get to that. There's also a bearing on the input shaft for the transmission side. We'll check that one here eventually. The bearing on the output or tail shaft to the rear wheels. First off that bearing feels okay. We'll do a little more in-depth checking later. We've got the towel packed in around here. Now we can lift this piece off. If you're careful all those little needle pins will stay stuck to the shaft. So here's what the bottom side of that looks like. No washer in there. Now you can adjust your towel a little bit better. Get yourself a little pill bottle, something to put those 47 pins in. And then get like a magnet. And then just start to grab a few of them. Very carefully drop them into your container. And uh, don't, don't lose any down inside. It's kind of like the adult version of Operation. Just lost two of those pins, kind of fell down there, but fortunately I have my towel, so got them both. Probably just as important. Don't let these pins fall out and get underneath one of your cabinets, because you know you'll never find it.
Okay, at this point, there is a washer on here that basically those needle pins are riding on that washer. So there's that washer. We're going to get that off of there, set it aside. So here's where we're at now. In my other video, I go through a little bit more on how it shifts into four wheel high, four wheel low, neutral, how those planetary gears down there, you'll see them rotating at different speeds based on which gear you're in. But for now, we're just going to rip this one apart. I did want to mention there is a magnet in here. It's a round magnet. It just slips in this slot. You'll eventually want to get that out and clean it. That sits right under the screen for the oil pickup. Okay, at this point, the next step is to pull this rod out that goes through the shift lever. It goes into a pocket down at the bottom. Get this rod up and out of the way. And now the shift fork, there's a pin that goes into this shift cam over here. Work that shift fork out of the cam. Just lift up a little bit here. The pin will pull out. Then you can just lift this entire assembly up and out of here as one piece. And that way you can kind of see where the shift fork goes in this groove here. So at this point there are no pieces that are going to fall out other than now your transfer case starts to get lopsided so make sure you got a block under the front axle side and you can set this entire assembly off to the side for now and we'll dig a little deeper into that later. These shift forks the plastic on them can sometimes wear out break off into chunks and a lot of times that's what you'll find inside of the transfer case is a bunch of chunks of plastic from the shift fork. I'm not sure what that might be a little piece of it right there in that groove but in general it looks intact. Now with that shift fork and the main shaft out of the way you can clearly see the planetary gears. There is a big snap ring there that you know acts like it holds in the outer ring of the planetaries but I took that off one time and it appears that outer ring is pressed in there pretty tight so there's really no point in taking that snap ring off down inside there there is a pocket bearing little needle bearings are in there they all appear to be there I've taken this planetary rotated it back and forth don't feel anything unusual. When I rotate it a little bit faster, it does make a little bit of noise, but I still have not found anything that would have been making the kind of noise that was ab really obnoxious. Uh, I couldn't hardly bear to drive in the Jeep for very long because I just got tired of listening to that. I do know for sure is that the new or rebuilt transfer case that we put in after we took this one out made a world of difference. It's really quiet in the Jeep now so there's something going on inside of here. A couple slightly unique things is all the bolts are metric except the nuts that hold the transfer case to the transmission those are 9 sixteenths and then the big axle nut that holds that yoke to the front drive shaft that's a one and one eighth inch nut. I'm gonna go ahead get this magnet out of here eventually you'll clean that up and it slides in that little slot and then I'm gonna tip this thing over and get the rest of this tranny fluid out of here. I can tell this tranny fluid that's in here is red, it's just ATF4. I know that because I put it in 
under the advice of someone else who didn't believe me when I said this is supposed to use a special transfer case fluid and the reason is because this has that viscous coupler which has those clutch plates in there so you need some limited slip uh, friction modifier type things in the oil so you can only use the Mopar oil don't use ATF4 best I can figure out if you use the ATF4 instead of the Mopar fluid you probably cause some troubles with the viscous coupler maybe some cornering issues with some skipping around the corners some hopping uh, you may have the viscous coupler lock up it may not engage properly may wear out too soon those kind of things and this Mopar fluid is not red just like motor oil got most of the fluid drained out now you can see this hole where the rod goes in that runs through the shift lever so that rod would go in there you've got your you've got the planetary gears here down inside there is a bearing I don't feel anything unusual there this front front drive shaft we can spin it it doesn't feel very smooth to me so right now this is my most likely culprit of where that growling noise was coming from we'll get to that bearing here in a little bit to get those planetary gears out we're gonna have to flip this over take the front cover off there's a snap ring in there and then we'd be able to pull these planetaries out for now I'm gonna focus on getting this front drive shaft out there's a bearing underneath down in here this is held in by a snap ring but this snap ring you don't expand it you actually have to push in right here to get this front axle shaft out of here you might think that you need to get this snap ring out of here but actually that's just holding in the bearing what you really need to do is flip this thing over we'll get the impact we'll remove an inch and an eighth nut then once we drive this yoke off then we can pull this shaft up and out of here and expose that bearing and that clip will be easy to get to then Now you're going to want to take this nut, put it back on the shaft, get quite a few turns out of it, then give this nut a few taps with the right hammer. started going in there back the nut off a little bit more and there she came off one thing to note in here there is this special rubber gasket that goes on the end here 
to block the oil from seeping out here, coming in through your splines and leaking out around your joint here. So, special rubber gasket goes on the end of there. But at this point, this shaft will just pull out. And there's your shaft. No miscellaneous loose pieces on here or anything. So you can set that aside now. Put the nut back on. You're going to want to inspect this yoke, especially here on the surface where the seal rides. Make sure you don't have any big groove in here. If you do, then you're going to have a hard time getting a seal and you're going to leak fluid. So we'll check this one out. It looks like there is a shiny line there, but I'm going to run my fingernail in there and see how deep of a groove we've got. With that front drive shaft removed, you've exposed the bearing here. I was hoping I'd find something that was really rough, would explain that growling noise, but this doesn't seem horrible. A couple things about this bearing is Mopar says this is a OEM part only. I'll give you the part number here on the screen, but it's got the little A after the NSK bearing part number and supposedly there's something super special about that although I'm not sure if I believe it but if you want to get this bearing out of there you're going to take this take this snap ring and you got to kind of pinch this snap ring together to squeeze it in and then it'll come out of this groove and at that point you could get something in there and you have to come in from the front and you have to actually beat on the internal race of the bearing to get it to come out of there which is hard on bearing so if you're not planning on replacing this bearing you should just leave it in there because it's really hard on them to beat them out of there by this internal race so for now I'm gonna hold off on that bearing actually to get this snap ring out you can get your screwdriver underneath the little cutout in the snap ring twist your screwdriver get that snap ring to pop up once you've got the snap ring up and out then you can pretty much just work your way around and eventually here that's gonna pop out this bearing is an NSK and it's real hard to read but it's a 6207 and that's a little a and then a 30 so a 6207 bearing would probably work fine but when it's got that little a that makes it the OEM part only so again if you don't plan on replacing this bearing don't pound it out of there it's a specialty bearing and it costs about 80 bucks at the dealership we've gotten about everything out of this side that we can get out so now I'm gonna go ahead and flip this over it's gonna drain a little tranny fluid here on your table but now you can take out these four bolts that are holding on this front cover this front cover does have a certain orientation that lines up a oil hole in the cover so you want to take special note of that when you go to put it back on you can mark it right now if you want to with some paint or with some other means such as a center punch very gently making a couple marks on there but basically when you go to put this back together that's when you'll look at it and you'll say okay there's the hole there's the groove in the cover those need to line up together now put the bolts in just be aware of that you've got the four 10 millimeter bolts holding this front cover on remove those the cover is usually held on with a bit of silicone adhesive for a gasket 
They do provide you with a pry point, so you'll want to go ahead and use that pry point. with a little bit bigger screwdriver pry point on this side as well this one's on there pretty good Okay, that one was really on there, so just keep working at those two pry points. And then you can pull that off. You can see here the passageway for the oil is here at the top. And that's going to line up with an extra hole. that's right in here. You want to make sure you don't end up getting that thing full of silicone. They're a little bit close here. So be aware of that. Now at this point you've exposed another snap ring. You can go ahead and get, there's, a, there's two snap rings. One looks like it's holding in the bearing, but in reality that bearing is just pounded in until that snap ring becomes flush with this cover. This other snap ring here is the one you need to get this one off. That will allow the planetary gears to basically fall straight down or pull out the other side. So we're going to get this snap ring off of there. Getting that snap ring out of there is easier said than done unless you have the right tool. But what I wanted to show you is when I rotate this I'm wondering if that noise is the sound that we were hearing when we were driving the Jeep. Of course I didn't have the camera rolling but I was in here fiddling around with this snap ring and finally I got it just to the right point and planetaries just fell right out. So they're laying here on the other side. At first feel, this bearing concerns me a little bit, but it's not exactly that smoking gun that I was looking for. So let's see what we got laying here on the other side. Well, it's a set of planetary gears. You can actually take this farther apart. There's a snap ring right in here. Get that snap ring out and then you can actually take this apart. And inside of here there's actually some replaceable parts. They're kind of like plates or discs. I'm not sure what the exact word is. I'll flash that up on the screen. But just running this back and forth It doesn't seem extremely noisy or to be a major problem. There's a little pocket bearing we've seen before down in there. That seems okay. So we'll go ahead and do a little inspection here inside the case and see if anything pops up. I mentioned this earlier but you have this extra hole here and that has to line up with that groove in this front cover to allow lubrication to get up to the front. So those have to be lined up when you put it back together. At this point if you wanted to you could knock this seal out, tap a new one back in. I mentioned before this snap ring, there's no need to remove that snap ring. 
the bearing is just tapped in until that snap ring hits flush with this cover. If you want to, you can knock this bearing out from the back. Here's from the other side. You could knock that front input transmission shaft bearing out using the properly sized pipe on that outer race, drive it out the front. Right now I'm doing an inspection of the planetary outer ring. I don't see any you know, bad teeth, anything like that. This bearing down in here does not feel horrible. I'm gonna do a little more checking here later, but you know, nothing horrible. Same with this one. This one doesn't feel too bad. And again, this is the $80 Mopar OEM part only if you want to replace it. Otherwise, you can get them at a lot of these online places for like, you know, 12 bucks or something. So I'll guarantee you those aren't anything special. I've never gotten inside the planetaries before, so I pried this little snap ring up and now just gonna work my way on around, get that snap ring out of there. Now this piece just comes up out of there. There's a couple of keyed slots that it slides up and down in. So let's do a little looking around in here. Okay, right here I can see that there is a little plastic band uh, around there. You can see that's separate. So there's one band there. Here's the teeth. You can inspect those. Down inside is that uh, pilot bushing that we've seen a couple of times. Now down inside here there is one more of these little rings just slips into those slots and goes all the way to the bottom. So that's down at the very bottom. That's what that gear right there is setting down on. So best I can tell, one ring, one sleeve down here at the bottom, and then one sleeve up here at the top. Underneath this main ring here. So those are some replacement parts inside the planetaries. So this is the one that came out of the bottom. I'm just going to keep it oriented in this direction since I don't know much about these sleeves or shims or whatever you want to call them. But it slides, you know, basically back in that slot. And then same thing on the other side and then all the way to the bottom. And then as we looked at earlier, there's one of those underneath that plate there. And those two would line up together and then align these together and everything should slip back in there you could put the snap ring back on and you'd be done rebuilding the planetaries. Here's the back half of that clamshell you can see the alignment pins and the pry points the pocket bearing here's the chain guard held on by a couple of bolts here more alignment pins and the pry point you've got your <clears throat> oil pump pickup tube screen right here slides into that slot connects to that tube this tube is not available from the dealership so you might have to get a used one from somewhere if anything's wrong with it. You can usually get this screen, but not this tube anymore. Now when you go to put this back together, you're probably just going to use silicone. You can get a gasket for this, but most of the time that I've seen, there's just a thin bead of silicone here. You don't want to get too much. This was a good job here. They just had a very small bead 
that came onto the inside. You don't want to get a whole bunch in there to where you get globs in here that break off and then get stuck in the screen, all that kind of stuff. So just a thin film, highly machined surface, you don't need much. So that tail cone and the output shaft to the rear wheels are going to go out that hole. Viscous coupler fits in that hole. You got this chain guard or guide is up on top. There's your fill tube or your oil pickup tube with the screen down at the very bottom. Right behind it is the drain plug. Drain plugs right there. The fill plug is right there underneath all this fluid. But that's your fill plug in there. Drain plug here. You can go out and you can buy onesie twosies of these bearings. Fairly cheap. I'm not so sure about these uh, pocket needle bearings here. Probably available, but I know for sure the bigger roller bearings are. But if you're going to go through this entire transfer case, you might as well get a rebuild kit. Comes with all the bearings, comes with these gaskets, the uh, front and rear seals, uh, those little shims that are inside the planetary gears, uh, on and on, little probably the O-ring that goes around this oil tube as it goes into the oil pump. Just a whole bunch of stuff, new needle bearings, uh, a lot of stuff comes in that kit for, you know, maybe $110. You're going to spend pretty close to that going out and getting a few onesie twosie items. Cleaned the old parts off here, got most of the grease off of them. This bearing here, it just got out of the solvent tank a little bit ago, so there's probably, you know, some debris got washed in there, but ever since the beginning, this thing has not sounded good to me. <laughs> And that's kind of the sound we were hearing driving down the street. So I'm pretty sure that's where the problem's at. This particular model of the transfer case did have this upper chain guide. There's some pre-tapped holes there. My other case did not even have the holes tapped. So apparently sometimes you may have that chain guard, sometimes you don't. You're obviously going to want to clean out that oil pickup tube clean the screen. Here's a pretty good shot of how that screen is right there by the drain plug. I was doing a little cleaning in the kitchen sink which my wife doesn't like and I turned this gear shifter a little too far and this popped out on me. But since I don't have a two-man operation I'm gonna loosen this uh, big nut back here That'll unthread it from right there, then I can get this back in, tighten the nut, I'll be back in business. Alright, got that screwed out. Here's what you got inside there. A little bullet, spring, got this plug. This plug does have an O-ring on there, so I'm sure they give you a new one in a kit, or you want to just make sure it's in good shape before you screw it back in. But that's what you got in there. Okay, this is a continuation of the ripping apart and trying to figure out what making the noise in the transfer case that we ripped out of Rathy's kids Jeep. I'm going to go ahead and put this thing back in there. We're going to take a little bit of oil and we're going to dab it on the threads and on that o-ring, kind of lube this thing up here. Then you want to turn this thing to where the teeth are facing the hole and then we'll uh, slide her down in there. Bullet spring plug. This is the bearing for the front drive shaft. Once you've got the snap ring out of the back here, this bearing will drive out toward us here. The only way you can get that bearing out is to hit it on the inner race. So you have to get yourself a, a pipe that'll slip down in there and knock that bearing out. But when you knock a bearing out by that inner race, it's kind of hard on them. So 
I wouldn't knock it out unless you plan on replacing it. Now this uh, front transmission bearing, this one does have a snap ring on it, but that's basically just there for looks. You don't have to take that off to drive it out. That's just there to basically as a stop, drive it in until it becomes flush here. But this one, you can get this one out. You don't have to take that snap ring out. So for that one, you drive it out towards the away from us here. You have to find yourself a piece of pipe that'll just fit down there, fit into the hole, but touches on the outer race of that bearing. So you can get this one out of, so you can get that one out of there on the outer race. So that's a little easier on them. So if you did take it out and you needed to put it back in, you could probably get away with that. You can see the four bolt holes that have threads in them that hold on that front cover. Then you can see that fifth or extra hole and that's the one you need to line up with that front cover so that oil can either probably drain back I think in this case. Just got these out of the sink, cleaned them with soap and water so this bearing right now is completely dry. So that's what it sounds like. I think it's a little suspect. I like to get them out and spin them on my finger and see what they feel like. You know, you can try and kind of go like this and see if you feel any rough spots. Nothing feels too bad, but the sound of it is concerning. Also, you can get yourself a uh, really bright little pin light LED, and if you can see down in there on the race, you can kind of work your way around, check the race. If you see any kind of marks on the race where the balls touch, any kind of like a washboard pattern, then you know it would be bad. If you kind of roll it slowly and you can kind of examine the surface of the balls and if you see any scuffs on them, then you know you can rule that that bearing is bad. But the best test for me is just spinning it on my finger. And you have to have it out to do that. This is the bearing for the rear tail cone that goes to the back drive shaft. This one feels the best out of any of the bearings. Again, this bearing is perfectly dry, soap and water clean, and so I want to spin it. Spins really well, and as it slows down, you want to kind of feel what happens when it slows down. If you hear, feel any little the, the, the rough spots, that's a good sign, but this one feels and sounds very smooth. It's not noisy like those other ones. Spins really well. Feels good as it comes to a slow stop. So I think this one's alright. The other two I think are probably bad. That's what was causing the growling noise that we were hearing in this transfer case. Here's this uh, front input transmission bearing. Completely dry at this point. It's open water clean. But again, much noisier than that uh, rear tail cone bearing for the back axle. So I think these two that are in here right now are the culprits for the growling sound that we were getting. And so I want to spin it. Spins really well. And as it slows down, you want to kind of feel what happens when it slows down. If you hear, feel any little thud, thud, thud. Down inside this tail cone, there is a user replaceable bushing down there at the very end. Would be a little difficult to get it out. I think you'd have to have that front seal out, and then you'd have to have sort of a special device, kind of like knocking a cam bearing in and out. Um, you can see here that snap ring that's in place and the access hole at the top where you need to 
spread that apart so you can slip that tail cone uh, rear shaft bearing and snap it into that snap ring. I really don't have any experience knowing how to tell if these pocket slash needle bearings are bad or not. I mean all the needle bearings are there. They don't feel rough. But again, the best thing to do is to buy like a bearing kit. You're going to get two of these. You're going to get three bearings and uh, new little needle bearings, 47 of those, and maybe a couple other little things, and that's like, I think about a hundred bucks or something. Or you can go out and try and find these at your local bearing store. These chains can get loose and cause a definite noise inside the transfer case, but typically that's more like a popping sound when they get so much slack in them that they actually start to jump a notch. This one, when I took it apart, was fairly tight. I mean, when they get loose, I mean, you know, you're going to have like a ton of slack when you take it apart. You're going to notice it. But this one, when I took it apart, was pretty tight. So I don't think this is the problem. You're going to want to do a careful inspection of all your parts. Make sure there's no damage to any of the gears or teeth. Everything here looks good that I've checked out on this entire thing. Checking out all your teeth, all the way around, making sure everything looks good. That's where your shift fork goes, right in that little slot. All these gears look good. You could take that snap ring apart and you could kind of pull this apart. Get that spring out there, it's that kind of funny looking spring. Bigger spring down underneath it. But, uh... All these teeth look good, so it's kind of a synchro, synchro teeth here. You want to make sure those look good because this thing kind of slides in and out of the hub, drops you in and out of uh, four-wheel low, four-wheel high. So those teeth right there, they need to be kind of uh, pointed and not all ground off. This is what's typically referred to as your viscous coupler. It's a very expensive part, around 400 bucks. I think that this particular one and the 99 through 04 Jeeps, this one is probably more correctly referred to as a progressive coupler because it is not sealed. You can look inside these slots, you can see the clutch plates and the discs down inside you've got basically a front gear and a back gear they can turn independently and I think what happens is inside of here you've got basically a pump and if your front wheels and your back wheels are not turning at about the same speed if you get like six percent difference in speed then you're gonna get enough difference in the speed here and you're gonna start turning this pump you're going to build up pressure and that pressure is going to force these clutch plates down in here together and now you're going to lock this thing up and you're going to start to now pass power up to the uh, front wheels. If the wheels are turning at about the same speed, you don't really need four wheel drive, then this pump is not going to spin, you won't have any pressure and it won't push these plates together. can just barely see those clutch plates spinning in there. This is fairly difficult for me to turn by hand, but I can do it. This is probably not the world's greatest idea to do this, but I'm going to go ahead, take a little brake clean, and spray down inside of here and kind of clean out in between these clutch plates. After I do that and it's all dried, then we're going to carefully pour in some of the special Mopar NV247 fluid. Make sure that gets in there and gets them real good and lubricated.
what's coming out is fairly clean down on the bottom but uh, this car did not have the proper fluid in it so what's coming out is red because they had just uh, ATF plus four in there not the special fluid so I want to get all that out of there and then get the right stuff in there before we put it back together if we put it back together after flushing the brake clean through there it's a lot easier for me to spin this and rotate those internal clutch plates what came out was not too dirty flushed out all that red ATF4 so you know we know for sure this thing's definitely not locked up that's one of the things that can happen this can lock up and then you get permanent four-wheel drive makes it a little noisy to drive a little tougher to handle and also your gas mileage goes down so this one's definitely not locked up the other thing is I'm sure what happens is you can basically all the pad on your discs or plates in there can wear out and at that point this thing probably can't grab and then put force to your front wheels so it either locks up or it's going to free spin I don't think you can look in these holes and tell whether you've got any pad on there or not but uh, you can possibly do that if this progressive coupler does fail in the locked up position the other typical symptom is you're going to get a lot of popping when you go around a corner because it's not going to let the front wheels turn at a different speed than the back and these clutch plates are going to pop 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 now I'm going to just let this thing sit there hang and let all the brake fluid pass through or dry out maybe rotate it every once in a while once it's good and dry we're going to come back and we'll squirt some special Mopar fluid down inside here and down inside all the gears and kind of get it you know good and lubed up again even if there's really nothing wrong with your progressive coupler there are times when you've got the right fluid in there the special Mopar fluid you've done everything right but they still pop a little bit going around corners I've read some threads out there on the internet where the dealership at that point will pour in a little bit of their special friction modifier and that will give enough lubrication that these plates in here will slip going around a corner and you won't get that pop 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 going around corners well it's about time to bring this autopsy to a close I wish we had a smoking gun and this would have been a little more exciting and we would have found a bearing that when we turned it it was super rough and we could say yeah this is a really bad bearing but the truth is it's pretty hard to tell if bearings are bad just by spinning them they act a lot differently when they're under load uh, where I work we've taken big bearings out of motors cut them open looked at them they don't look too bad but we know they were noisy as heck and when we replaced them now the motors quiet so you really have a hard time saying for sure just by spinning I've put a little bit of oil in these bearings now so they don't rust but you know whether that bearings bad or this one down here just by spinning them it's hard to say we do know that the noise that we heard sounded like a bearing noise it went away when we put in the transfer case that was rebuilt so something had to be wrong so bearings are the most likely cause of the noise so I would recommend replacing all three bearings this one here is an SKF 6206 space N slash C3 6206 is your basic one this one here I flashed up a couple times that's a 6207 with the little a you can buy the 6207 at any bearing store the 6207A is a Mopar proprietary part about eighty dollars this one down here I believe is a 110L I used a Timken in the last one that I rebuilt but you can also use the uh, SKF brand for all three anyway we're gonna bring this one to a close 
I don't have a use for this transfer case, so I just tore it apart because I was curious what was wrong with it. So now maybe I'll try and sell these on eBay or Craigslist or something like that, see if I can get a few bucks for some case or miscellaneous parts here and there. So I guess thanks for watching and hope you learned something. I do have two other videos out there where I'm tearing apart NP247s, putting them back together, giving out a few tips. As I've said in my other video, I'm not an expert, I'm not a transmission guy, I'm not even a mechanic. But uh, I watch a lot of YouTube, fiddle with things and figure stuff out. So if I can help anybody out by letting them watch me, that's great. 